Hi, and welcome to another episode of Start the Week with Wisdom. I'm your host, Bridget Burns from the University Innovation Alliance. I'm Doug Letterman, editor and co-founder of Inside Higher Ed. Each week, uh, Mark, well, Doug and I team up to have a conversation with a sitting college president or chancellor or a leader in the field that we think can give you some compelling advice. And, and ideally, we want to set them up to be able to share their wisdom with our audience. Um, and we always want it to be very positive and uplifting. And that's why we call it Start the Week with Wisdom, because we know it's a Monday. Sometimes the Sunday scaries can be hard, and we're hoping that this makes it a little bit better. Weekly Wisdom is sponsored uh, by Mainstay, formerly known as Admit Hub, the student engagement and retention platform that has proven it works through peer-reviewed research, uh, which is a very unique thing um, if you look at, at tech companies. Um, for instance, it helped Georgia State be able to reduce its summer melt by 21%, which is you know, nearly unheard of. Um, that was also conducted uh, with peer-reviewed research. And they later helped them um, be able to retain an additional 1,200 students they weren't expecting to. So uh, generally speaking, we think you should check out uh, that and also the other work they've done with a variety of other campuses at mainstay.com. And today's guest is Mark Milliron, who is president of National University in uh, California. Um, Mark has an unbelievably eclectic background. He's worked in the foundation world. He's worked uh, at uh, co collect organizations focused on collective action, like League for the Innovation of the Community College. He's worked at online institutions and uh, been on fac faculty side, uh, been a dean, uh, ran institutions, a uh, really wide range of uh, experiences that have led him to national. And we're going to talk about his uh, his experiences. Welcome, Mark. Good to see you. Hi, Doug. The only job you haven't had is Secretary of Education, right? No, I don't know about that. <laughs> you're, it's a gracious way of saying I can't keep a job. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> well, no, but you. I will say we can probably start there is that, um, you know, I think that it's very unique to consistently level up in your roles. You stay for what I think on the outside looks like the right amount of time. And yet you always seem to find something even more interesting. Um, I think there are some folks who peak early or who peak, you know, in the middle or even peak late. But like, it just seems like for every time I've, I've talked with you, you have a role that is even more interesting than the last. So I just been wondering, how do you as a, the person with this career, like, how are you making these decisions? Like when to I'm sure people come to you and, and, and bring opportunities all the time. But um, if do you have any like philosophy that you would share with Think of especially early career folks who are trying to think about a career like yours someday. No, no grand strategy, Bridget. Um, you know, I, I think if you went back and talked to the 17 year old bus boy working at Rusty Pelican, uh, going to Mesa Community College uh, and said, hey, this is the trajectory of your career. I would have thought you were crazy. Uh, for me, um, it was combination of serendipity and then really a combination of curiosity. Uh, really wanting to learn different things and then really wanting to make a difference, um, trying to make sure that what I was doing was meaningful and actually was helping people in some way. So I kind of fell in love with um, working with inspirational leaders, inspirational people that were doing powerful work that could make a difference. I loved learning new things and I, I was never, I, I've always had the courage to kind of jump in and be a rookie and try something new, especially in areas that are, are, are kind of unfamiliar to lots of different folks. So I've been counseled by lots of folks over the years, Bridget, like, what do you thinking. I can't imagine you're going to leave this job. This is such a phenomenal job. Um, and I've always, you know, those choices are often hard, but I've usually made them because it's going to give me an opportunity um, to learn something more and to make a, more of an impact if I do it the right way. And then you, you add in, you know, you always have family things that are happening at the same time. So, you know, again, that combination of serendipity, curiosity, opportunity, and the chance to make a difference is, uh, is probably what the mix is all about. Mark, what about what what would you characterize as the other than those things, which all make sense and I think could could apply to a lot of different careers? What would you characterize as the sort of through line from a subject or or uh, focus standpoint? I mean, I, yeah. I think I kind of see one, but I'd be interested in how you think about it. Um, recognizing the serendipity and all the other factors. Yeah. You're talking about. There is a, a incredibly clear red thread through my career, which is like I have, if it wasn't for um, places like Mesa Community College, Arizona State University, um, institutions that were committed to access and, um, and excellence, 
um, I wouldn't be here. I'm why, and I totally, if it wasn't for the kind of education opportunities I had and the right people showing up at the right time, um, there's no chance I'd be, I'd be doing the kind of work I'm doing right now. So I've absolutely fundamentally dedicated my life to helping more and more diverse students be more successful in the world of higher education so that they have more opportunities in their lives. And that kind of more, 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 more framework is uh, it is the core purpose of everything I've done. Um, and every step I've made in my career has been trying to help uh, help that trajectory become uh, more of a reality for more people. That's fantastic. And I do hope that that's helpful for folks because I know that people make, you know, there is too often this emphasis on the hierarchy and the ladder, right? And climbing up and that we should, <clears throat> everyone, you should aspire to being a president or you should aspire to being, you know, again, secretary of education, but that you, you really have kind of focused on different altitudes, but um, always adding more nuance and understanding about improving and serving out uh, serving students and how to um how to advance change i mean i think about when i first met you at gates like it's it's like you, you spent the time directing the field and then you went back into the field um to see how how you might have gotten it right or wrong and how you might evolve that thinking further so um i want to turn to just the concept of leadership and i don't know who your big mentors have been in life but i am curious about whether or not um, you know, if you think about how you learn to lead, um, who yeah. taught you what leadership is? Um, and I'm curious about whether you learned um, more from watching good examples of leadership or bad. Yeah, it's, a, it's always a great question. Um, you know, my doctorate was in leadership and I fell in love with leadership in lots of different um, areas, whether it's in um, business and industry, whether it's in the military, whether it's in sports and academia and, or, or sports and, and coaching. Um, and then, in, of course, in the world of, uh, of academia, uh, I've always been kind of enamored with folks who can, um, I guess, work the art of leadership in a really clear way. And along the way, you know, all kinds of models, all kinds of people who've inspired me and, and kind of, whoa, if I could just steal a little of that, steal a little of that. Um, I think it, you kind of you put together the picture that makes sense for you. Um, and for me, it's been a combination of good examples and bad examples, right? So uh, early mentor, Nathan Hodges, small college in Western North Carolina. I got to work with him as an academic VP um, and, and being able to just watch him, his ability to kind of ground a team and really create a safe space and do hard work, be able to ask hard questions was amazing. Getting to work with like Charles Mitchell when I was at the League for Innovation was a chancellor of the Seattle Community Colleges. Walking down the hall with him and seeing him stop to pick up trash off the floor and not letting it go by, knowing the name of every janitor in the in the building, like just those moments where you're kind of blown away. Jerry Sue Thornton, who's a longtime chancellor of uh, the Cuyahoga Community Colleges, was amazing. Her ability to um, kind of think big, but also kind of think about the crawl, walk, run to make something like that happen. And the whole idea of um, helping mature an organization over time, working with Jim Goodnight at SAS and his commitment to creating a place that nobody wanted to leave, right? That whole idea that if people could believe in something and want to kind of, uh, and know that they were being treated well, they'd want to drive against that. And then, you know, new folks now like Suzanne Walsh at Bennett College, who has just stepped into a, an HBCU and taken it to a whole different level um, and, and have helped them embrace change and notions of anti-fragility and, and kind of um, taking the kind of voice of Bennett to a whole different level. So it, it's been amazing watching folks like that. And then the negative examples are are powerful as well because you're like, for the love of God, I'm never going to be like that. I never want to be like that. And, and they're almost always driven by um, ego needs and power um, power plays and you know so much of the me 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 stuff that it's exhausting. And and what's good is it's instructive because it helps you understand what is really um, what really will not help you kind of move things forward. I'm um, I'm super intrigued by the fact that you are both on the board at Bennett, um, or you, you're, you've been on a board for a university, and now you have a board, and now you're a president of Bennett. Right? Again, you've done this before. I'm just curious if, um, does being, pre be, being in your role right now, do you feel like you're a better board member? Um, do you feel like you are um, better to your board because you have empathy for their position? Like, I'm just curious about their, yeah. that's not a very common thing. I've done a lot of board work. So um, obviously when I was with League for Innovation, we had a 20 member board of presidents and CEOs and them talking about their boards was incredibly instructive. And we ran something there 
that was the League for Innovation Trustee Institute, where we would actually bring the board members and the trustees together and talk about how do you build a great board relationship. And nothing was more instructive than me than watching, you know, five years of those and hearing kind of the truthful, like this is where it goes wrong, this is where it goes right. Um, and then fast forward, I, you know, I was on the early board of trustees of Western Governors University and helped um, kind of you know, was a part of the group that helped kind of vision what that could be in the long run. And it was amazing being a part of that larger conversation. Um, you know, and I've been a part of probably 30 other boards in the process, including corporate boards. Um, now I'm on the board of Civitas. I'm vice chair of the board at Bennett College, and I'm also chair of the board for our own City U at National. Um, those perspectives absolutely help me understand how I want to create a great board relationship. And one of the most important things we're trying to do is, um, one, let boards play to their superpowers. Like, you know, really kind of serve, be servant leaders, make sure you're serving the board well, involve them deeply in the strategic work and, and engage them in the policy and advocacy work and help them help you in terms of creating the right kind of infrastructure to do amazing work. But that, you know, that doesn't just happen. Um, that, that is really a shared, uh, shared process and um, a kind of storming and forming and connecting. And so our, our board at National has been amazing. They've adopted these kind of ways of work focusing around everything we do is around championing student success, building trust, advancing inclusion, embracing accountability. And I love our last one, which is just make things better. And make things better is, you know, that's everything from the big innovation to, hey, let's create the policy that allows people to do their life's best work that could be simple small things to really big things and um you know for me it's just really kind of great when a board sings and kind of does the kind of work they can do for an organization and doesn't um you know doesn't really get in the way they're actually kind of empowering for the organization i'm, I'm curious uh, a lot of presidents and leaders of institutions don't have the kind of board exposure that you did and i'm curious if you have thoughts about how people in this audience who might be, you know, thinking about moving up to a presidency someday, what what advice do you have about how to go about understanding that relationship? Because I no. do worry that a lot of presidents walk in without really having that experience. It, Doug, it's such a great question because I think early in my career, I had, you know, I was so hooked on practices, like these things will change the world. And then I realized that practices are wonderful, but if you don't have the right enabling policies, they're never going to take hold and, and you're never going to be able to make them happen. And I, I think the more you get exposed to the combination of you need great practices, you need great policy, you also need great leadership skill and will. Um, and, and kind of developing people over time. You know, the advice I always give to people is you've got to get on some boards, get on some boards, especially boards you've, that are, are functional, that are doing some good things and, and just show up and understand the process and understand how you know, those kind of gifts are given. Um, that'll help you understand the dynamics of policymaking. And then you start seeing the interplay of institutional policy crafting versus state versus federal versus um, kind of organizational and, and programmatic kind of policy frameworks. You understand this is a, this is a Rubik's cube. You've got to be able to kind of twist and turn. And if you've never played the game before, it gets really tough. I um, I want to pivot to just generally um, back to your career and your leadership journey. Um, and, you know, not to go to the hard part, but I'm curious because I, I bet it would be difficult for you to pick a favorite experience because you've had so many. Um, but I'm curious about what, you know, you have every different altitude across different types of institutions across the country. What's been, um, as a leader, what has been the hardest challenge for you? Um, if you can think of one particular um, needy experience that you had to, did you have to navigate as a leader? Um, yeah. Just give us a sense of kind of, because uh, I think for folks, what they're wondering is what sticks out after such um, depth and breadth? So I've, I've been incredibly blessed to work with some really inspirational and, and um, meaningful folks. Um, and I think one of the hardest things um, is there are times when you are um, leaders, there are times when your team members really kind of um, let you down, right? They're, they have, they have their own failings. There are times that, you know, when your own failings kind of hop in the way. But there are those moments when you just kind of realize everybody's got feet of clay and people are complex, right, for all kinds of different reasons. And I, I think you, um, you know, in your early years, you kind of get... Um, uh, almost uh, bimodal about it, right? People are either good or they're bad. And then you realize a lot later, wow, people are complex, right? People are very complex and people come with their superpowers and people come with their blind spots. And it's a realization, that, oh, by the way, I've got 
things I can do really well. And I have some areas where I could really get some work and you want to be open to that conversation. So I think there are some moments where I, you know, I had my heart broken, right, by some folks who were really close. And that's just hard. It's just really hard because you thought that person was that way and they turned out to be another way. And, you know, and, th and again, sometimes that's somebody who works for you. Some of it is somebody who works with you. Sometimes it's somebody you work for. Um, and in all those cases, it, it hurts just the same because it really is kind of a, a almost like the, the end of a dream. Right. In terms of how that plays out. And you kind of like, OK, now I've got to figure out how we're going to work. Now, one of the things I will say, Bridget, in that process, I've learned is the power of grace and the power of um, realizing um, understanding that people are complex and being willing to engage and connect with them. Some of the people who have broken my heart early or whatever it was, like I've kept a relationship with them. And later on, I've actually turned out to be really impactful of folks in my own life and connection. So it, it is, the, again, the realization that even though somebody breaks your heart, it doesn't mean you write them off. It means you just kind of like think about the moment for a moment, take a moment and, uh, and make sure you can uh, understand what that might mean for you kind of going forward. But, you know, simple answer to your question is usually that's the one that hurts the most. It's the people side. That's um, very honest. And um, I'm, it's, it's a relief because I actually, I, yeah, I agree. That is the hard part, right? The, the, too much people forget that when we're talking about leadership, when we're talking about governance, we're talking about change, da, 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 it's all about people. It's trying to get people to change. And so if you have to, yeah. it's, you know, understanding how to motivate people, inspire them. But at the end of the day, the fallibility of humans um, and, you know, yeah, relationships. That's, um, yeah, I really appreciate your honesty about that. Um, and not to being like, oh, well, we were merging 17 universities. <laughs> it would be something that's like not relatable, you know? Um, Doug, do you want to jump in or otherwise? Um, keep going. It's fine. I'm, I'm enjoying the conversation. Well, I, I'm for you, what has been the most surprising aspect of your career? Like what has caught you Look back. Know, I, I think probably the most surprising part of my career, Bridget, is um, the desperate need for people really want to be a part of something that's meaningful. They really want to be a part of something that can make a difference. And if you do the work of creating an authentic place that, that is mission driven, that really is about, you know, uh, that really is about that. And people want they're almost like dying to believe in something that's real. And there's a real responsibility with that, because once you kind of realize that, you realize you, you have the opportunity to create an environment where people can do their life's best work and they can really make the difference they want to be able to make. But what I've been amazed is if you do the work and no one believes you up front, you have to do the work and put in the time. And as you create that environment, like people will just come out of the woodworks and they want to be a part of it. Like, I want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of that. But you have to put in the time. And if you will unbelievable talent skill will will show up and rally to your cause it's just it's just it's to me it's been amazing how how universal that truth has been in every stage of my career is if you do the work to create the right kind of environment that people want to be a part of that is especially one that is mission driven wow like all kinds of people show up like donors show up and partners show up and then folks who want to be on your team show up just because i just think people are hungry to be a part of something they believe in um I'm guessing the, the answer to this question may tie back to uh, what you described as your as the sort of uh, red thread through your career. But what um, what do you believe is most needed in higher education at this moment? And I mean, I'm, I'm guessing that uh, uh, well, at, at, you're at national now, so how, maybe tie us tie a little bit to sort of how you are believing you can help achieve that there, but what what are the, I assume you wouldn't be somewhere where you weren't trying to pursue that big need, but so what, how would you describe when you look at this whole ecosystem particularly, yeah. but what, what most needs to happen? Yeah, and actually part of that explains why I'm even, at, why I'm at National. Uh, National, when I started the conversation with them, it was just such a coming home in some ways you know they was founded by a navy captain i'm a navy brat um, my dad used to teach her in san diego um, the focus is totally on um, opening doors and pathways to possibility for different kinds of students so just such a resonance the more i met with the board met with the faculty and staff I'm like wow these are my people like i want to be a part of this work it's you know it's 250,000 graduates and two thirds are diverse. Uh, it is all focused on everything from, you know, um, certifications and associates all the way up to PhDs and DBAs and CIDs. I just love the expanse of it. But 
as much as I love National University, it is not the be all end all. And I, I would argue in the world of higher education, there is far too much, um, and Bridget's heard this, and we say this before, there's far too much better than conversations. Everyone's talking about this being more important than or better than, this model is better than this. And I'm just such a believer that we have these, um, especially for low income first generation folks, most of them stay in the regions they were born. And if you can get a family of educational providers to work together and have better with thinking as opposed to better than, meaning I want my K-12 to be radically successful, both public and private. I want my community colleges to rock. I want my state universities to be fantastic. I want my R1s to be doing it. And I think places like National, like Western Governors, like SNU, like all of them play a role in helping that ecosystem be successful. And we get so oddly competitive when there is such a massive need right now for education. We have 40 million people in this country, according to the National Student Clearinghouse, that have some college and no credential. And if you just untap that potential, hell, we'll take 1%. You can take all the rest, right? It's the idea that there is so much work to do. We just got to figure out how we can work together in this and be absolutely willing to say, hey, National is phenomenal for this kind of student at this time. We're going to be amazing for them. But hey, if you're an 18-year-old that wants a campus space experience, for the love of God, don't come to National. But if you're a working student who's coming out of the military who wants to kind of advance your career if you're or, or want to go get your PhD and we can help you do that, or if you want to get your ELL you know, certification so you can work in construction, we have all of that, but it's kind of playing to your strengths and figuring out how we can work together. So to me, in the world of higher education, it's a little less shaming, a little less blaming, and a lot less bluster, and a lot more like, how can we do this kind of work together and then celebrate when other people are successful? I com completely agree. Um, a shift to the best advice, well, we had just got really intense. Um, the best advice that someone else gave that was valuable career. What was it and who gave it? Yeah. So um, a couple. Uh, one, uh, Nathan Hodges, going back to one of the first president I worked for, um, he uh, he and I co-authored an article together. And I and obviously just come out of a leadership program and he was bringing 40 years of experience in doing his work. And we were kind of working together on this frame. And we end up with this frame that I still go back to all the time. And it was this idea that the core of really good leadership is getting grounded, getting real and getting going. And I love that frame. It, and the idea of getting grounded is doing the work collectively with your teams around what is your mission, your vision, your what are your values? What's your kind of core strategy? What's your plan? Why do you believe it? And that grounding work is really valuable. But then once you get the grounding work, you got to get real, which means you need data to understand what's working and what's not and be willing to face brutal facts. Like this is where we're terrible. This is where we're good. And let's figure out how we kind of move ahead. And then once you get grounded and get real, then you get going. And, and that get going phase is like you test, try, tune, collaborate, pull ideas together and just kind of work towards achieving those mission and vision elements, watching that data along the way. I just love that frame. And, and you know, Nathan and I, when we whiteboarded that, I still remember it to this day. It's, it's been fundamental to probably how I've approached every piece of leadership I've ever done. Um, the other one is, you know, Jerry Sue Thornton used to talk about this idea of you can be um, you can be right and lose badly. And there's no more true, <laughs> no truer phrase I've ever heard is like I've known people who are because they've won arguments and they've destroyed relationships. They've won the, won the moment, but they just can't lead their way to the right place. And, and I think it's the realization as a leader. It's not about being right. It's about doing the right things in the right way and figuring out what that really looks like. And the last one is one I you know, my team here, God bless them. They hear me say it all the time, which is we need to do fewer things at the A level, not more things at the B and C level. It is about making the main thing the main thing. We we all are so, there's so many brilliant people in the world of education. We end up excited by 15 different shiny objects. We got to get down to the ones that really matter for us that, in, in this moment and really focus on doing them at a really high level. We had that conversation at Western Governors all the time. In the early days of Western Governors, everybody had ideas about what we should do, especially as we got accreditation and took off. People went, oh, you should go international. You should go workforce. You should go this and that. It was like, and it was just Sam Smith from what from Washington State, Bob Mendenhall, longtime president there. They would just kind of focus on that idea of like focus, focus, focus. But you saw that at Georgia State. You saw that at um, you know Arizona State. Like they picked the things that they were going to be good at, and they went and executed on it. Yeah, no, that's great. Those are all wonderful pieces of advice. 
Doug, do you want to ask about? Uh, well, yeah, just I, I, the, the corollary to that, uh, which there's sometimes overlap, but sometimes uh, differences as well. What are you, what advice do you pass on uh, either, you know, T, uh, elements of what you just said or completely new things. What do you tell people who are uh, coming to you at this stage of your career for uh, guidance on how to, how to build theirs? Yeah, I think, you know, a, a few things. One is, um, you know, I fought competitive martial arts for years. And so one of the things I learned was the power of balance. Um, and that's the, you know, kind of the realization that in some ways, you know, there's, there's, that phrase from the King Arthur, uh, uh, King Arthur uh, legends about, you know, you are the land, which is how you take care of yourself will emanate. And um, a good friend of mine, Head Abdo de los Santos, has this, he, he wrote a piece with Steve Middlestad, who was an amazing president at Richland College for years, where he talked about leadership from the inside out, where you've got to kind of do your work internally and take care of yourself. Um, that really matters. It matters more than you know, because, it, because of the second thing, which is when you are in these roles, you're on stage nonstop. And that doesn't mean you're giving keynotes. It means your emails. It means the tone of voice. It means how you approach meetings. Every little thing is being watched by people who want to do good work and they want signs. They want signals that they're going in the right direction or wrong direction. And you've got to have a level of awareness. You have to have a level of mindfulness that is exhausting. And because of that, you know, you've got to recharge. You've got to take the time to recharge and get yourself up because you are going to be in that place. And the people you're serving deserve it. They deserve you to be focused that way. So you've got to take the time to be able to kind of have that yin and yang between self-care and then awareness about how you're kind of driving yourself forward. And, and the last thing is just, you know, uh, I'm a big believer in rookie courage. I think it's really, really healthy. Um, we were talking uh, before we got on about Alzheimer's. Um, I got really interested in Alzheimer's and dementia uh, because of uh, deep connections with my family members who, who, who wrestled with it. Um, and so I really got into you know, brain research from the UCLA Center and from the folks in the Netherlands. And one of the things I loved is this idea that if you want to stave off Alzheimer's and dementia, one of the most important things you can do is just be a rookie every year. Learn something that stretches you out of your comfort zone. And it's unbelievably healthy for your brain. And I have found that that process of learning new things, whether it's now going to be about AI or going to be about this or about that, it stretches you in a way that just helps it's healing and it's comforting and it's wonderful. And um, I think you end up kind of getting to a much better place. It also is wonderfully humbling um, and, and it helps you get connected with those students who are coming in and having that experience in your own place. Wow. That was wonderful. Uh, thank you so much. Is, I, I will ask, is there one, is there one leadership book that has been most useful to you in your career that we can leave behind for our audience? Oh my gosh, I wish there was one. Um, I, I will tell you that we do this thing called the, uh, we call it dessert at the end of our our university leadership councils every month. We literally share a different book that everybody reads for the next month. And so we've recently, we've been reading um, Extended Mind uh, by Annie Paul, which is amazing. Range by Epstein, which is phenomenal. If you're a champion of liberal arts, you'll love range. Um, we also, because we're a military affiliated institution, we love the wis wisdom of the bullfrog, um, uh, which is at, which is it's a neat book by McRaven. Um, and uh, the newest one that I'm absolutely in love with is Poetry Unbound. Um, the Poetry Unbound collection is powerful, um, and especially a couple of poems, the Book of Genesis by uh, and, and also Wonder Woman, just unbelievable poems. I would encourage you again as a leader to to take a moment that's part of that kind of, uh, again, recharge to kind of do that kind of reflection and connection. I mean, there's real power and healing in that reflection and recharge you know, coming out of that reading. And not to mention, it's not just books. It's also these days you have all kinds of different media you can pull together, right? Well, that was perfect. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you being so generous, sharing your wisdom with our audience. And so thanks as always for, uh, for participate. This has been really great. And Doug, thanks for being an excellent co-host. For those of you at home, we will see you next time.